mono price, monolith, THX, 365T, mini tower, speaker. Nailed it, that only took five times. All right, I received this speaker for review on loan from Monoprice. I wasn't paid or anything like that. But what we have here is a speaker that is about 450 bucks for a single. So you're gonna pay 900 bucks for the pair. It's got pretty good output in terms of home theater use, but the linearity on this speaker is not to my liking. It does need EQ. Now, why do I say that? There's a few things, right? So let's start with the low frequencies and work our way up. On the low end, you're gonna need a subwoofer. This is a THX rated speaker, and most THX rated speakers, in fact, I think every THX rated bookshelf type speaker, uh, has an F3 at around 80 hertz, which means that it's already lost 3 dB in output by the time it hits 80 hertz compared to the mid-band frequencies. And it's gonna start rolling off, and this F10 is gonna be like around maybe 40 hertz or so. So you're gonna need a subwoofer for this speaker. That's really no surprise, so I'm not gonna complain about that. When you get up to the next step, in about the 100 to, I don't know, maybe 200 hertz region, there is a mild Q bump in the frequency response. When I was listening to speakers, or these speakers, what I heard was some resonance, and I was listening to a Vince Gill track. Yeah, country, I dig it. Among other things, except for jazz audio file music, oh, that's not my thing. Anyway, so when I was listening to Vince Gill's track, uh, I think it was Don't Let Our Love Start Slipping Away. It kind of stood out, a little bit of a bloom in the in the mid-range, and I thought, well, that's interesting, okay. Paid attention to it for other tracks and continued to hear it, mostly with male vocals. I put in my notes that it was probably around like 200 hertz, but when I went and looked in the data for that, I didn't see anything at around 200 hertz. But what I did see is a mild Q bump around that 100 hertz region or so, and I'll point that out when we get to the data. The other thing that I wanna note is the high frequency is just, man, it's, it is not to my liking and definitely needs EQ or room absorption to tame some of the issues that I heard. Inside the enclosure, we've got the big, large passive crossover down here at the bottom. Now that's gonna control the three-way speakers up top, you know, send signal to the tweeter, the mid, and then the two woofers. And actually at the top of the speaker, which I did not review on purpose because, um, you know, frankly, I'm not sure how one would go about reviewing this type of design with the Atmos speaker. Now, I know some of you are out there thinking, oh, you didn't do a good enough job, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you do it, all right? Personally, I'm not interested in what they call them. Some of these guys call them bouncy house. I think that's what Gene at Audioholics calls them, bouncy house speakers. Um, and yeah, I could have set the clip up to measure it, but I don't know. I just don't find that important. And what really is interesting is the majority of people complain about this kind of design, which, okay. I also must mention that I did receive the tower speakers for review. Now I've already reviewed the center speaker. The tower speakers, they push the limits on my clip hole by about one inch, literally one inch, and I could not measure the tower speaker. Now I can tell you what I think about how it sounded. Overall, it's very similar to this, very similar tonality, uh, just more bass. And that's really kind of about it. But since I can't give you any feedback as to tangible evidence like data, I'm not gonna be reviewing that speaker, unfortunately. And that sucks, I know. I wish I could have. It's a nice speaker. I don't really have a problem recommending it, especially when you're using it with an equalization like you would with a uh, AVR that has Dirac or Odyssey or something like that built into it. But again, I don't wanna go into that because I, I didn't really truly objectively review it and I don't think it's quite doing the service that I intend to do for the community when I just purely subjectively review speakers. So that is not gonna be discussed by me, unfortunately. The top and the bottom mid-range cross it around 500 hertz and then this little dome mid-range takes over, it's a two inch dome mid-range. Actually, here you go, you can see it right here. It's got its own little enclosure. And then the tweeter takes over, I think at around two kilohertz, maybe it's 1.9, it's something like that. Specs will be on their website if you're curious. When it's transitioning from the two woofers to the mid-range, you have a, a lobing pattern, comb filtering pattern, where the response narrows up a bit. And it's not terrible, but the problem is once you start trading off to that mid-range, the response widens out even more. So in the room, you have less room interaction, maybe above like 500 to one kilohertz. And then from about maybe one and a half kilohertz to maybe like four kilohertz or so, 
you've got a widening of the response. When those things happen, you have more energy reflected off the side walls, and in relation to the mid-range, the high frequency sounds elevated. And if you look at the estimated interim response to the data, which we will in a minute, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now that gives it a sound to me that certainly sounded a bit harsh, uh, a bit grainy at times in that two to four kilohertz region. And then I also noted when I was listening that around the eight kilohertz, there was some sibilance there. So I went and looked at the data, try to correlate that. And yeah, it's, it's no mistaking. I also see that in the estimated in-room response as well. So if you are listening to these speakers out of the box, it's not a speaker that I personally would buy. If you are listening to these speakers with equalization, which I'm assuming that you probably are because you're probably gonna be using these for a home theater type setting, then you can tweak the response and they will sound pretty darn good. And I, I did that. What I did was I took two to four kilohertz, put a filter around 3K on it. I think the Q was like maybe two, I can't remember now. And then I dropped it down a few dB. I think I got like three dB. Did something similar to the eight to 10 kilohertz region where I dropped that down. I wanna say it was like four dB or so. Most auto room correction filters will help do that if you tell it, you know, the target that you're looking for. But I tend to manually tune because I wanna to try to figure out where the problem areas are, listen for it, make adjustments, and then I can mention this in my review and, and be better off for it and help you identify where the problems are gonna be, back that up with the data, and I have some concrete evidence for it. So those are the things that I noticed when I was listening. Now, in terms of output, this, this speaker does really well with distortion. I don't think it even crosses 1% until it hits about 80 Hertz. And that's at 86 dB and then again at 96 dB. But the compression shows some weird results where there's a boost and enhancement in the output as you go from 76 dB to 86, 96, 102. We're gonna talk, that, we're gonna talk about that in the data in a little bit. But these are some things that I kinda wanted to mention up front for my listening sessions. And they correlate track very, very well to what I see in the data, which is always a good sign because it tells us that we're on the right path and that we have an idea of how to make those maps and then that also gives you more confidence in what I say as far as, is this a speaker for you? Now, if you're gonna listen with EQ, then yeah, it's I recommend it. If you're not gonna listen with EQ, then honestly, I, I just can't recommend it. And I hate saying that because most of the mono price stuff, I really do like, and I expected this one to perform better than it did. Now, I know that others have listened to the speaker and reviewed it and reviewed it well. So this is just kind of my personal take on what I heard in my listening, and then the data backs that up. Speaking of the data, let's go ahead and switch over and I will show you the results from the Klippel Near Field Scanner Spin. Now the Klippel Near Field Scanner is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows you to get anechoic data in an in, 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 in non-anechoic environment, such as my garage, which you see here in this video. And that's great because again, it allows you to have good, reliable and accurate data that will show you issues that you may not understand why are there when you're listening to the speaker, but you're quite certain that you hear something, or it helps validate a rather good design. And in this particular case, it shows us a speaker that doesn't do great when it doesn't have EQ, but when it has EQ, it performs better. First thing we're gonna start off with is the Spinorama data. On axis response, actually looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a bump here in the mid bass, which I talked about earlier where I thought maybe that was some of the resonance that I was hearing. And then if you go on up through the higher frequencies, it looks pretty good until you get to about, was it like six kilohertz or so? And there's a strong on-axis cancellation. I'm not necessarily sure what is causing that. It could be diffraction, or it could be actually the tweeter housing itself. Unfortunately, I'm unable to tell. And then after that, you can see that you increase in output. And the combination of this dip and then this increase is what was causing me to hear the treble being a bit hot in the eight kilohertz area. But another thing I wanna point out here is right through this area where the early reflections and the sound power increase, but the on-axis response and the listening window response stay pretty linear. So this means that above about plus or minus 10 degrees of the tweeter and then to the side of the tweeter at about plus or minus 30 degrees, the response is pretty much the same. So that's what the listening window indicates by following the on-axis response. But when you get past those points, you can see that something else is happening here. And it's also reflected here by this pretty large dip in the directivity index. But past that, you can see that you're going pretty good. 
And then you get around to this dip again where you suddenly increase in directivity. And what does that really mean to you? Well, that means that you get ETH, EQ through this area, and then that you could EQ through this area, and you could also EQ this a little bit as well, but maybe not this eight kilohertz area. So depending on what you're hearing and what you like or dislike, you may be able to equalize some of those issues out. The two issues that I had were two to four kilohertz and above around eight kilohertz. And if we look, two to four kilohertz is pretty nominally flat. You could EQ that down, which I did. And then above about eight kilohertz is pretty nominally flat and slightly increasing above 16K, which means that you can EQ this down as well, which I did with success. Now, if we go and look at the estimated in-room response, we can see exactly what I was hearing in the room and what I was complaining about when I said there were some sharp, shrill sounds in that two to 4K area. So if we follow this through here, we can see there's a peaking around 1K, a dip, and then another peak, and then a dip, and then another peak. If we drew an imaginary line, we would see that this area stands out and this area is going to stand out. And those are the areas that I had issues with. But as I just said, you can equalize those down. So going back to my comments earlier about how I would recommend the speaker, and I said that if you don't have equalization, then I would not recommend the speaker. But if you do, then I would. That's why. Now, if we look at these fancy glow plots that I create, you can see that the radiation pattern is pretty wide, but it does show some distinct issues. Again, there's a dip at around 1.3 kilohertz, but there's this solid stark dip at around, it's closer to five kilohertz, maybe six kilohertz, and it's strong. Another thing to consider with this graphic is that with the listening radiation pattern, I would say that you're at about plus or minus 20 degrees, maybe plus or minus 30 degrees, where it's gonna be a good window of seating. But again, with these dips right here, that's what's really causing things to get knocked off course. If not for those, you would easily be out to about plus or minus 50 degrees horizontally. And in terms of the vertical response, if we're looking at the speaker from the side, and this is the front, and then this is the back, really what I wanna take away from this graphic is that vertically speaking, you could sit within about plus or minus 20 degrees and you're gonna hear roughly the same sound as you would hear dead on axis at the tweeter, which means that the people that might be sitting in a different row, or if you use these as side surround speakers and you had to put them up a little bit higher than normal, as long as you stay within about plus or minus 20 degrees, you're gonna be okay. But ideally you wanna stay within maybe plus or minus 10 degrees or on that tweeter axis. As far as what amplifiers you would need, you're gonna want an external amplifier. And the reason I say that is, even though this speaker is mostly above four ohm, there is a point where it dips down to almost three ohms. And this region could present a bit of a problem for most AVRs and it probably will. Therefore, I would probably have to default to recommending a separate amplifier. But if you're curious, do you absolutely have to have that? I would say, look, it can't hurt you to try it on your modern AVR. Most likely it's just gonna mute the outputs. You can check with the manufacturer or you can just give it a go and see what you think and always buy another amplifier later if you absolutely have to have it. The good thing about this speaker though is that it does have relatively good sensitivity with about 88.6 dB in output. So that's pretty good, it's not the greatest, but in terms of home theater speakers, that's pretty good. That's about where I think you probably want to be. And as we can see in this graphic, the F3 is at 84 hertz. This is harmonic distortion at 86 dB, and this looks pretty darn good. I mean, you are well below the 1% THD threshold, which rides this negative 40 dB line. And you can see you don't even cross that until you're at about mm, 70 hertz or so. And then if you go to 96 dB, you're still below 1% THD until about 80 hertz or so. So this is telling us that distortion-wise, this speaker has the ability to do pretty good output volumes. But in terms of response linearity, as you go from low volume to high volume, there are some issues. These issues also cropped up with the center channel that I talked about earlier. And namely the one that I'm calling out attention to is right through here. And to be honest with you, I'm still not sure what's causing that. I know the crossover region for the mid to tweeter is at 1.9 kilohertz according to spec. And that would probably explain maybe some of this additional output due to excessive distortion. But this one right, right here really kind of throws me off. And I actually did take the mid-range out of the enclosure 
and I tested it a few different ways. I was curious, was there some kind of resonance inside that was causing some extra output? Unfortunately, I wasn't able to verify that notion, so I'm still not sure what's causing this issue. Are you gonna hear this? I just don't know. I do this test to help us determine what a good speaker design is, and when I see results like this, it's off-putting to me, but I gotta be honest with you and tell you that unless somebody is gonna be able to do blind testing, this is a data point that I have that I feel is good to have, but maybe not backed up by scientific research yet. I still think it's a good indicator of a good quality design. And in this case, there are some things that concern me about it, but at its given price point, I think you might be willing to overlook it. And that's it for this review. I hope you learned something. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I have a Patreon. If you want to check that out, it'll be in the description below. And that is all. I hope you all have a good one. Talk to you soon. Peace.